Hello and welcome to my presentation. My name is Simon Dennis and today I'm going to be talking about memory for where using smartphone data. My collaborators on this project were Elizabeth Laliberte, Adelaide McKenzie, Young Wolf Yim and Benjamin Stone. In 1984, Ronald Cotton was convicted for two counts of rape and two counts of burglary. He was sentenced to life plus 50 years. Cotton was exonerated in 1995 after spending over 10 years in prison when DNA evidence demonstrated that it had been Bobby Poole who had committed the crime. Now, this is a famous case in the memory literature because the uh, victim, Jennifer Thompson Canino, uh, pictured here, uh, on two occasions provided a misidentification. So, in an original um, in person lineup, she picked um, Cotton. And then in a subsequent retrial in 1987, when um, Bobby Poole was actually brought into the uh, courtroom, she picked Cotton again. So even though the actual rapist was right in front of us, she picked Cotton. And so this is uh, a demonstration of the, how um, choosing a certain uh, person or a certain object can influence people's subsequent memory. But there's another important aspect of this case which is often um, overlooked, and that's that Cotton gave a, uh, a false alibi. So instead of remembering where he was on the, at the time of the, uh, of the crime, he um, recalled where he was the week before. And so as a consequence of that, his alibi didn't um, check out. And so that was um, also a contributing factor for the fact that he was um, convicted. But how reliably can people remember where they've been? What factors affect that memory? And what questions might a detective have asked to uncover the false memory? So these are all very relevant questions from the forensic point of view, but they're not ones that we can readily use laboratory um, paradigms to answer. So in the laboratory, we manipulate things like font colors and, and um, you know, we have different kinds of uh, fractal images and so forth. Um, and so there are certain things we can manipulate, we can discover general principles of memory. But in this case, we really need to know the specifics of what is, um, how likely is a, uh, is a memory for where or a memory for when or for a memory for a person um, likely to be an error. So we conducted a study where we um, had people go out with a uh, app on their phone, which recorded a number of different data sources. So it um, recorded GPS, it recorded um, small segments of obfuscated audio, and it also recorded accelerometry. Now, this was done using the um, Unforgettable um, Research Services system, and the Unforgettable system then takes that, kind of, that raw data and processes it in a number of different ways to create a representation of the different events through which um, people go. So um, on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, you see the app, um, on the right hand side, you can see some of the events that have been captured by Unforgettable. So from the GPS, for instance, we're able to um, uh, identify the address, uh, we're able to get street view images and so forth to get a sense of what people might have been looking at, and we're able to establish what the um, weather was like and so forth. So all of these sources um, allow us to create a more complete picture of the experience of the individual. In our first experiment, we had uh, 57 participants. And as I mentioned, we collected accelerometry. This was done 10 times a second continuously um, and for one month. And so that um, leads to about 51 million data points per, per participant. Um, we had GPS coordinates every 10 minutes, so about 8,640 pairs per subject. And then we had these um, short audio segments. So they're short to stop from uh, recording people's conversations and compromising their privacy. And so these were collected as null frequency capsule coefficients every 10 minutes or so. There was a one week retention interval and then they received a memory test. In the test, they see, received a series of trials like this. So they were given a time. So down here at the bottom, you can see the time. In this case, it was Thursday morning, 8 a.m. on August 15th. And they were given four pins and they had to identify uh, which of these four locations they had been at at that time. 
all of the locations were taken from um, places they had actually been uh, during the, um, the collection period. So they had to distinguish between um, when it was they were at that particular location. And when we did this, the people were accurate 64% um, of the time. Now what we did is we ran a conditional logic model in order to establish um, how important each of the different aspects of the event that we recorded were to people's choice behavior. So unlike a normal logic where you just have a, a set of predictors and you're trying to um, produce a consistent outcome, here uh, each of the um, choices has its own set of predictors. And so what we're interested in is the weighting of the predictors. And these are um, Bayesian credible intervals, 95% credible intervals, um, around those uh, conditional logic parameters. And so you can see, and perhaps not, um, not surprisingly, that uh, GPS has a much larger impact than, say, either the um, audio or the accelerometry. I should mention the, the reason that these uh, beta weights here are negative is that we took the distance from the uh, correct location to the location of each of the alternatives in these different spaces as being the, um, the predictive variable. So for GPS, for instance, we would say, um, how, what's the Euclidean distance in, in the GPS space between the correct alternatives and each of the alternatives, and they would be our predictors. So therefore, um, big negative um, will be um, indicated because a larger um, distance should make it um, less likely that you're going to um, be confused about that point. We also ran a um, conditional logic using um, categorical time. So uh, we can do it with time and we did that, uh, but we also did it by looking, uh, scoring the predictors uh, in terms of whether they were on the same um, day, hour and week as the, um, the original event. So, um, so the day column here, or day variable here, would indicate that this, um, the event that they um, mistakenly said was um, the correct one um, was exactly a um, complete week out. So it was on the same day, but, but the wrong week. Um, the hour means it's the same hour, but the wrong day, and the week just means it was in, um, it was in the same week. So you can see here that all of these um, variables were um, very significant in terms of their impact. So here's the zero mark over here. Uh, but this day error where people um, give the, uh, the right day but the wrong week um, was the strongest of these. And so this is the error that Cotton made. So in experiment two, we look to um, expand upon this by looking at the impact of people's emotions as they are um, engaged in their everyday uh, lives. So this time we had 67 um, participants, 14-day uh, um, collection period this time, and we used Unforgettable as we did in the last experiment, but we also used um, SEMA3 app. And so SEMA3 allows you to query people um, throughout the day, and we queried them um, on 11, 11 uh, discrete emotions. So for instance, um, how anxious do you feel right now? And they had to make a um, rating on a um, zero to 100 scale. Um, we ran the same kind of exper um, experiment as last time with the, um, the four uh, locations and they had to choose amongst those. And this time people were accurate 67% of the time. So what we can do is that same kind of conditional logit um, model. And so what we're looking at is to what extent um, are two events more confusable in memory to the, if they have a similar emotional uh, profile. And so we can look at this for each of the emotions, and you can see that in um, all cases, um, the results are highly significant. So people's emotional states really do seem to make quite a significant difference to the likelihood of, the, of them choosing a similar state. Um, there's a little bit of a stronger effect for the um, positive emotions and the negative emotions, um, but nonetheless, uh, strong effects across the board. What was perhaps more surprising was what happened when we did a, a more traditional um, logistical regression, um, where we looked at the relationship between um, 
uh, sets of, of predictors and the likelihood of an error. So here we're not looking at um, the choice behaviour in terms of which options did they choose, but just were they correct or were they incorrect. And so we joined a number of discrete emotions together. So we had low positives, so that would be um, things like content or relaxed. Um, uh, high positives, so that would be things like um, happy or excited. Negative lows, so that's um, things like um, uh, disappointed or bored. And negative highs, so that's something like angry. Now, unlike the, the um, laboratory uh, data, what, you, what we found was no effects for negative emotion. So typically it's the negative emotions that drive um, effects in the laboratory, but not so when you go out into the real world. Um, the, the results of the positive emotions were much more interesting. So here we see a positive effect. So um, it was the uh, higher they rated their um, uh, emotions like content and relax, the uh, more likely they were to get it correct. And um, conversely, if they rated, rated a emotion like excited highly, um, they were less likely um, to get the trial correct. Um, so this is really interesting and a little bit um, counterintuitive. What we think is going on with the um, positive low event is that uh, people are um, experiencing those um, kinds of emotions when they're in um, high probability locations. So uh, things like home and, and so forth. And therefore, there's, um, there could be a, a bias towards responding with, with those kinds of um, locations. Why it should be that the positive high event um, would show a negative effect, though, um, is much more puzzling, and we don't have an answer for that at this point. So in conclusion, after a, a one to five week retention interval, people are able to identify where, where they were about um, two thirds of the time. And we have the second experiment with the replication of the first in that regard. Um, distractors that are similar in location or similar in categorical time um, are more likely to be chosen. And distractors that have similar emotional concepts are more likely to be chosen. So negative emotions at the time of encoding do not seem to um, predict accuracy. Um, but however, low arousal positive emotions are associated with better accuracy and higher arousal positive emotions are associated with worse accuracy. So to go back to the, um, the more applied relevance of this question, what should detectives be asking? So Cotton, uh, you may recall, um, recounted where he was on the wrong week and thus led to a um, false alibi. Um, and our data seems to support that that's a dominant error. So um, it is the case that people are likely to mistakenly um, choose uh, the right day, but the wrong week. Um, but in addition, the days before and after, and just the week in general around the event are, um, are also important. So if you're a detective, um, it would be a good idea to be asking, not just about the time that the crime actually occurred, but about um, that time, um, the previous week, that time on different on days around that as well. And that may uncover some additional errors. Um, now this, of course, is just scratching um, the surface. There's um, a lot more work to be done, but I think what this does is it demonstrates how we can use experience sampling data to build a much more quantitatively rigorous and translationally relevant memory science. If you're interested in the kinds of technologies that we were using here and, and potentially using them yourselves, um, I'm actually the CEO of Unforgettable uh, Research Services, which is a company that we've set up to um, help people to in implement these kinds of technologies. And so the app and a bunch of other um, sources are available. So if you're interested in that, um, head on over to www.unforgettable.me and um, you can find out more there. So thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>